I hope this has been beneficial to you, not just to realize how important the armor is, but that you are a masterpiece. You're a masterpiece in progress, that the realization that when God's signature is upon my life, I can make a mark for him in the earth. And our job and our goal is to live lives that he could come through, that he could shine through, that when people would look at us, they would say, I see God in your life. I see God through your life. And that is really, really important. We never want to be those people that say, I love the Bible and I love the Jesus. I just don't like the people that say they love Jesus. We don't want to be that description. We want to be a description of his goodness, his truth, and so that people can see the word in us and see God through us. That's a masterpiece. And so we've been going all through Ephesians, letting Ephesians talk to us about what it means to be a masterpiece of God and to live a life worthy of his goodness and his praise. We we should inspire the world that doesn't know him. Do you know your Bible says that? We should inspire the world that doesn't know him, not make them go, no, thank you. We should be an inspiration by the way we live. And so I'm excited to get into this today. I've had this thought, I've said it a couple times that, Many of you have spent most of your life dressing for your profession, right? Whatever it is you wear for your profession, you get dressed to be in your profession and to do what you do. But have you spent any time getting dressed for your purpose? Because your purpose is way more important than your profession. And so if we're going to get dressed for our profession every day, we've been looking at the armor saying we should get dressed for our purpose. And the armor of God is that where we dress for our purpose, what he's called us to do in the earth. And so I love this because it sets us up to go out into the world, into our profession, and do what we're really called to do, our purpose. Live through him and let him live through us. And so today we're gonna get into this one more time. Has anyone in here ever purchased an iPhone, a used iPhone, a used iPad, or a tablet, or a computer of some sort? Come on, you ever, you ever purchased a used one? It, maybe found it on Facebook or something and met someone in a Lowe's parking lot and then thank you, thank you, goodbye. Isn't that funny how we do that nowadays? I think that's really interesting. And you're, you kind of don't know if you should meet them or just take your thing and leave. So it's kind of like, thanks. Hi. <laughs> is, is that awkward transition? Anyone else struggle with that? Maybe that's just me. Like, is this as awkward for you as it is me right now? I'll just take it and leave then. Goodbye, right? But this, the used thing, and here's the thing. When you buy something used like that, like an iPhone or a tablet or something, you, you, you kind of want what you want on it, right? You ever had someone give you one that didn't get a factory reset? <laughs> I, got a t- I bought a tablet one time for the church, and on the front of it kept bringing up these, ro- these romance novel ads. <laughs> Who reads romance novels in here? Thank God. Someone's hiding it. Romance readers. And it it just could continually, every time I'd turn it on, the romance novel ad would pop up. And those things are like this far away from pornography. Like seriously, right? Like the, the prince on the big white horse and the long flowing hair. And it's like, oh my goodness. And no, every time I'd try to get rid of it and delete it, I'd swipe it, I'd swoop it, I'd swap it. Whatever it was, it was like, go away, go away. And I'd open it and there it was again. And it's so frustrating. Like, I don't want this on my tablet. When we buy something used or we buy something, listen to me, for us, we want it to work for us. When we purchase something for us, we want it to work for us. We want what we want on it, when we want it, and why we want it on there. Isn't that right? Like, no, I want to set this up for me. That's the whole purpose. This has a lot to do with what we're talking about today. If you've experienced this, you know what I'm talking about. We want what we want. We don't want any more romance scenes. Come on. No more romance ads, please. That's kind of what this looks like. This is kind of a description of salvation, and that's what we're going to look into today is the awesomeness of salvation and what salvation is and how God set it up. And so let's get into our scripture today. In Ephesians, we're in chapter 6, and we've been going through all of the armor that we put on. And today I'm just going to hone in on one again today, but check, check this out. Ephesians chapter 6, if you got your phones or something, follow along with me because you can mark some cool stuff as well. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. Notice the full armor. Be all in. Don't just put on one piece. Put it all on. Put put the full armor on. Go all in with God. 
so that when the day of evil comes, you'll be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Who is here for the belt? Come on. Truth is a belt. Hold your pants up. Belt of truth around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness in place, which is a body armor of righteousness in place. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And so we have been through all of these looking at what does it look like to put these on, to live in these, to have these going on in our life. And then look at verse 16. This is what we're going to look at today. In addition to all of this, so on top of all of this foundation, take up the shield of faith, which can distinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Last week we called that distractions because the enemy just wants you distracted, but faith keeps you focused. And then take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Notice the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon that we find. Isn't that interesting? The shield sets you up to be offensive so that you can use the offensive weapon. It's so cool, which means we're not supposed to be going backwards. We're supposed to be going forward toward the enemy. But today I want to talk about this helmet of salvation. I just want to hone in on this a little bit today, and I think it will help you. This helmet of salvation. Did you know that salvation is a helmet? Like if I was to ask you, who in here is saved? Probably most people raise their hand. Yeah. Did you know that salvation is a helmet? Salvation is a helmet. It's the helmet of salvation. And I really want to help us get this today, how important this helmet is. Now, do I have any, anyone in here that w- was born in the 80s? Any kids born in the 80s? Come on. 80s kids, check it out. Whoop, whoop. Go 80s. You guys like, you guys are losers. Go 80s. <laughs> L- let me just tell you what we never heard, you 80s kids. We never, ever, well, maybe, heard this. Put on your helmet. We did not hear, put on a helmet. Put on a helmet. Oh, get your helmet. Hold on, stop. Where's your helmet? We didn't hear that. Like, we were the guinea pigs. Like, you try it first, I dare (laughs) you. Right? We didn't get to hear this put on your helmet thing. We didn't need it. We, We were the guinea pigs. And anyone before that as well probably didn't get to put on a helmet. No, we didn't hear this in the 80s. And so... Sometimes this idea of a helmet can stand a little off to us. Like, yeah, I don't know if I need a helmet, but yeah. Well, check this out because we lived in the era of I don't need a helmet to somebody somewhere thinking everyone needs to wear a helmet. And so somehow this started to get into our generation where now you need a helmet. And so ads like this started to come out. Do we have an ad up there? Yeah. Protect your head or end up dead. And we're like, mom, dad, do you care about me? Like, why did I never know this? I I never heard of this. Like this stuff, this, did anyone ever find this shocking? Like, don't you, don't you love me, mom? Right? Like these crazy ads started coming out about how important a helmet was that I, I kind of thought, man, just kind of felt like my Folks maybe didn't care about me very much because we never wore helmets. We, we never got to wear helmets. But nowadays, nowadays they got a helmet for everything. There's a helmet for everything. You got the bicycle helmet. How, how many remember when the bicycle helmet seemed dumb? Anyone remember that where it was like, are you really going to wear that? Yeah. Remember it used to be like this long? Had like a, <laughs> like you'd try to ride your bike and it would catch the wind. It was like, are you really going to wear that? And so this was hard for us 80 kids because it was like, I don't know if I want to look dumb. I don't want to look dumb, right? We got the bike helmet and then we have the motorcycle helmet and then we got the worker's helmet where you, well, that's just kind of obvious. And did you guys know there's a rancher's helmet? They got a rancher's helmet now. I hope you, you ranchers better have your helmets on out there. Who, do, who wears that moving cows? You guys are like, you're an idiot. See, I can tell this bothers some of you because you're like, I ain't wearing no helmet. Make me look dumb. I ain't going to look dumb. 
right? You feel that, don't you? You just don't want to say it. When I got my motorcycle, I didn't get a helmet because I thought I'd look dumb. But you know what I found? I got something for you. They also have a they don't know you're wearing it helmet. Check it out. (laughs) Now, I would wear that. That is awesome. They don't know you're wearing it helmet. (laughs) I love that. Oh, I just want to look at it. That is so awesome. You could even have a man bun if you wanted to wear the girl one. And so we got you covered. We got you covered. Wear a helmet. Wear a helmet. But here, here's the problem is if we kind of grew up in that era or that maybe, maybe didn't have to grow up in that era, we get this idea that, you know, I don't need a helmet. I don't need protection. I got this all figured out. And we got little slogans like life is tough, but you're tougher, right? Life's tough, so be tougher. Life's hard. Life's tough. Things are rough. You just be tougher. Just be tougher. You got this. Right? We kind of we kind of subscribe to that idea in certain areas where things are hard, but I'll just be tough. I got this figured out. And I, I could still kind of be in that vein around the helmet situation where it's like, pfft, I'll wait till I really hit my head hard, right? No, life's tough. Wear a helmet. That's what I want to say to you this morning. Life is tough. Get on a helmet, and especially, listen to me, especially in a spiritual situation, in a spiritual uh, era or moment, wear a helmet. That's what I'm going to tell you today. Spiritually, life's tough. Put on a helmet. Put, even it has to be the helmet that they can't tell you're wearing. Life's tough. Put on a helmet. Put on a helmet. And I feel like Paul is shouting this, put on your helmet, because spiritually, it's really, really, really important. And I want to show you why and how today. The scriptures are going to show us why it's so important today. Let me show you when Paul was talking about and saying, you know what? Salvation is a helmet. When Paul's trying to figure out how do I, how do I describe salvation? How, how can I put it to something that you could make sense of? He comes up with this idea. It's a helmet. Salvation's a helmet. Well, this is the kind of helmet that he was thinking of. This is the kind of helmet that he would have been seen and thinking of back then. Notice they thought of hair on the helmet before we did. And the the interesting thing about the helmet that he's looking at is the helmet did two things for you. The helmet protected you, which means it brought safety, but it also was identity. Did you know that? The helmet was identity. This was your identity. The Mohawk determined who you fought for and what you fought for and what you were a part of. Like, no, we're with this army. I'm with this group. That, that's what the Mohawk was all about. It was identity. And then the rest of it was safety. And so when Paul's thinking about how do I display salvation, he was thinking of identity and safety. Identity and safety. A helmet. A helmet is identity and it's safety. So is your salvation. When we think of salvation from God, it is your identity, it's who you really are, and it's also safety. It's safety from the spiritual world that we live in so that we can operate correctly in the physical world and make the mark that God's called us to make. And so this helmet did two things that were really, really, really important. And so let me just talk a little bit about salvation this morning because I think this will help you. Salvation doesn't mean go to heaven. A lot of times we think that. Like, are you saved? Yep. And in our mind, we think that means I'm going to heaven. But the word salvation, nowhere will you find going to heaven. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that's not the result, but it does not mean going to heaven. The the Greek word for salvation is actually sozo, sozo. And what it means is to be safe. It means to be rescued from danger. And it means to be preserved or protected. That's why it's a helmet. So when you are saved, you are safe, you are pulled out of and protected from danger, and you are preserved. That's what the word salvation actually means. And if we were to put on spiritual goggles and look at this, it means that one has grabbed you from the enemy and pulled you out of hell in darkness and put you upon a rock so that you would be protected from his plan for your life. 
Isn't that awesome? We should erupt at that. Like, thank you, Jesus, because he's pulled us from something, protected us, and now is preserving us from the work of the enemy. That's why salvation is so awesome, because we've been now protected from, we've been saved from. And sometimes when we think that it means just to go to heaven, we miss the whole point of how awesome salvation really is. Salvation is awesome. It's an awesome promise. And that's why it lines up with being a helmet because it protects you and preserves you. It's your protection. It protects your life. And so sometimes we think uh, another aspect of salvation is that I get saved from my sin. Anyone ever thought of what is salvation? Well, it's the fact that Jesus just forgave me for all my, from all my sins. My sins are forgiven. Or I just gave my sin to him. Right? You ever thought of that? Like, I guess it's given in my sins. That's what makes me saved. Are you saved? Yep, I just kind of brushed all my sin over there to him, and he took care of it. But the scripture says this. The scripture says that Jesus saved you from your sin. Isn't that interesting? So if, I was to, if you were drowning and I was to save you from drowning, I would pull you out of the pool, right? <laughs> I'd try my best, I promise. I would, I'd pull you from the pool. I'd get you out of it. I wouldn't leave you in the pool. Like, you're doing great. Just breathe. Put on a helmet. So, right? No, I, I'd pull you from the pool. I would save you from the thing that's drowning you. I'd pull you from the thing that's trying to destroy you. And so salvation is Jesus has pulled you from your sin. He's pulled you out of it. Let me just try to help you with this for a second. Sometimes we think that what Jesus wanted was all of our sin. But he wanted so much more than that. He wants so much more than just your sin. Let, let me show you in Revelations, actually. Revelations talks to this, and this is really cool. As John is in a vision about Revelations and, and recording everything that he's seeing, he's, he sees this, and this is so cool. This is talking about Jesus. For you, Jesus, you were slain. You were slain, and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Do you realize how powerful this statement is? Here's what John is saying. Jesus, you gave up your life. Your body was broken and beaten and abused, and you didn't do that to get man's sin. You did that to get man. Jesus didn't purchase your sin. He purchased you. He wanted you. That's how valuable you are. Salvation isn't me just throwing my sin over to Jesus and going, thank you. No, he wanted me. When he went on the cross and bled and died and took that beating, you know what he was doing? He was getting you out of your sin so that he could have you. He wanted you. You are what he purchased. And then we have scriptures that say things like, you were purchased with a high price, therefore honor God with your body. <laughs> the beginning of that scripture says this, you don't even belong to yourself. You belong to God because what Jesus did when he went on that cross for salvation was to buy you. He wanted you. And I think that is awesome, the realization that he purchased my being so that he could move through me as a person through me authentically, through my DNA and through who I am as a person, he wanted to move through me. And so he bought me with his blood. And he bought you as well. And what is salvation? Salvation is realizing that you have been purchased by Jesus. And that what he did is he jerked you out of the grips of the enemy. He pulled you from and saved you from and bought you with his blood. And that is salvation. I hope that makes you feel valuable this morning because your life matters. You are very, very valuable. You were bought with a price. You belong to God, and he takes really good care of his property. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You belong to God. And so this helmet 
of salvation is the fact that I've been purchased by him and I am preserved by him. I didn't just throw my sin to him and go whatever I, whichever way I wanted to go. No, here I am. Here I am. Have your way in me because you bought all of me. And so I was thinking about salvation, really. Salvation is a factory reset on your mind. And this is where we get into the other part of the helmet. Salvation is that factory reset on your mind. See, anyone in here ever given their life to the Lord and felt like nothing changed? I know I experienced that many times. I think I got saved probably five or six times because I would say, yes, Lord, I want to serve you. And then everything else in me would go, no, you don't. We want to go that way, right? I still want to live for myself. And then I'd kind of wake up like, what am I doing with my life? And so I'd, I'd hear a message and I'd break to God and be like, yes, Lord, I want to serve you. And then everything else in my being would be like, no, you don't. You want to go that way. And it was like, why is it not changing? Why am I trying to give my heart to God, but everything in me feels like it goes that direction everything in me is still fighting what God wants to do with me and because there is a work in salvation that listen to me that we have to do that allows us to experience the fullness of God and the fullness of salvation to put on the helmet is work to put on the helmet is a work that makes salvation make sense where you can start to realize oh that's what God did in me See, when you give your life to God, he does a big thing inside of you, but you have to align your life up with what he did in you. How many know we're three-part beings, right? We're mind, soul, and body, right? So we, we are a spirit, but we live in a body. And whatever's on that mind, if you haven't had a factory reset, you still got romance novels coming to the forefront going, I don't want to read you anymore. What is this annoying, right? There's a work that needs done that aligns with the work that he did in us. And that's the part of this helmet that has to do with our mind. I want to show you today how to put the helmet on. You want to put your helmet on? Even the one that they can't tell you're wearing it helmet? Come on, put your helmet on today. I want to show you how to put on your helmet today. I want, the, I want to let the scripture show you how to put on your helmet today. And it might surprise you. And it might shock you, but let me just tell you something. It is a lot of work. It is a lot of work, but it is the best work you can ever do. Ever, 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 ever. It is so important. And I feel like the, the majority of Christians that I work with and walk with, this is the issue, is the helmet. It's the issue. <laughs> watching my son play baseball he's just starting to play baseball and a lot of those kids they have to run and hold their helmet at the same time it just looks adorable because it'll just fall off you know that's what we look like a lot of times like just hold your helmet on we've got to do the work of keeping the helmet on our head let's look at this scripture corinthians if you got your bibles or bibles or phones go here with me second corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 this needs to be on your refrigerator this is how you put your helmet on right here. Look at this. We take captive every thought. And look what we do with it. Take captive means this, arrest it. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you in the court of law. Do you understand your rights? Some of y'all are like, I've heard that a lot. We take captive. We, we arrest. Listen to me. I want you to get how serious this is because some of you are like, I've never done this. I had a girl tell me this one time, I never knew I could control what goes through my mind. Like it was completely like, oh, I never knew there were any controls up there. I just thought whatever went through my mind, I had to submit to. No, you have a lot of control over your mind, but it starts right here. Here's how we put on the helmet. I arrest every single thought. And I don't just arrest it and let it go. I make it obedient to Christ. Every thought. Oh, hold up. You're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can and will be used against you. You're not. I'm not. You're out. You're out. You can stay. You're out. You can stay. Take captive every thought and make it obedient 
to Christ. That's how you put on this helmet of salvation. And if we've asked God to do a work in us, but never put on the helmet of doing this right here, we will have a change on the inside and never see it on the outside and wonder, why am I still struggling with these stupid thoughts? Why am I still struggling with this crazy stuff? Why do I feel so pressured and so tempted to do this dumb th stuff? Because we're not doing the work of salvation, taking captive every thought. And here's how I like to line this up. How do I make it obedient to Christ? If you know the God of the word, you can ask, would God say that to you? Would God say that stuff to you? The, a good, good father, would he, would he say that to you? If he wouldn't, get it out. Would he encourage you to do that? Then get it out. Would he prompt you to do that? Then get it out. Nope, you're out of here. Make it obedient to Christ. This is putting a helmet on. This is salvation. Where I realize I'm a new creature, I'm gonna begin to pay attention to what goes through my mind. Think about how many thoughts you think a day that go unchallenged, unchallenged. Some of you might move off of every thought. You think, well, I thought it, I might as well do it, right? And no, we, we've been called to check our thoughts. That's what salvation is. I think of this sometimes like when I go to Walmart, I feel like a lot of people need to take their kids captive. <laughs> because sometimes we get this idea of like, you know, my child can just be whatever it wants to be. It just needs to express itself. No, it doesn't. You need to take your child captive and make them obedient to what you want them to be. Isn't that being a parent? It is. It's no, I'm going to show you the way. Of God, I'm going to show you. Here's what I really think it is. I'm going to show you what you can be by helping you. And so when I go through Walmart and my kids want to try to kick the bouncy balls, and some of you are like, I still do that. Or jump in the bouncy ball thing. You, any of you adults jump in the bouncy ball thing? Right? I, you know you want to. Take those thoughts captive. Or whatever. Pull things off the shelves and act crazy. No, 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 no. No, I'm taking you captive because we don't do that. That is not what we do. We do this follow me, right? Take captive. It's the same thing. We have things going through our thoughts all day long, things that make us want to throw tantrums and act foolish and act ungodly. And do we take those captive? And do we make them obedient to God? And say, no, I'm, I'm going to be like this. And so that's the first part of salvation. And that's how it becomes through all of our being, we start to see ourselves experiencing what God has for us. Salvation is this. It's renewing the mind. It's renewing the mind so you can live like a child of God. The Bible tells us to renew our minds. And I feel like sometimes we just dive in and say, yes, God, I'm yours. But we never do the work of renewing our mind. It doesn't say removing your mind. It says renewing your mind. Renew it. Let me show you this, Romans chapter 12, and we'll be done here today. I want to show you how important this is because this work right here has to do with your destiny, about what your life amounts to. What is your life going to amount to? When you leave the earth, what's left? What's left? Look how important this is. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Look at here's why it's so important. And then, then and only then, then and only then will you be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You know how many people I have met that have given up on God because they couldn't figure out his will? I don't know what he wants for me. Man, I, I met one of the most precious guys one time. He was in the church for months, and I just, I loved this guy. And he just left overnight one time. He was just, he just was gone. And it was like he quit coming, he quit showing up, he quit reaching out. And I finally seen him probably a year later, and I was like, dude, where have you been? Like, what, are you all right? Like, what's up? And with all sincerity, he said this to me. I gave God my life and said, you can do whatever you want with me, and he didn't say anything. So I gave up. I'm like, dude, 
dude, I've prayed that prayer 50 times, 100 times with the same result. Like you got to keep going. You've got to test and approve the will of God. You've got to position yourself. So when you hear nothing, you can still test and approve. That's God's will. And I'm going to do it until I hear something. That's where I'm going until I hear something different. And the amount of people that cannot test and even approve, even see this is God's will, it's horrifying because of this, that we don't renew our minds. We just allow the same old stuff to keep coming up and it never gets tested, it never gets confronted, it never gets removed. We just, we just let it do its thing and we can't even see the will of God. We look out to try to find out what God wants to do with us and we see nothing, which is like, it just looks like a whole sea of stuff. I'll just do what I want, but there is a will of God for you. There's a will of God for you in the earth that you're called to walk out and it won't be found unless we choose to renew our mind. And here's the caution. Don't conform to the pattern. Don't conform to the pattern. You have to fight against that because that's the default, right? The pattern's the default. Like you'll just end up doing what everyone else does. You just conform to the pattern of living. Wake up, go to work, come home, go to bed, wake up, go to work, come home, go. We just, we're, we're in the pattern. And it's like, yeah, I guess this is just God's will for my life. This is what I'm doing. And next thing you know, we're in a pattern. All of our thoughts are in that pattern and we've never stopped and confronted the pattern. No, don't conform. Look what it says. Transform. Transform. Like that's a work. Transform from the pattern by renewing your mind. If you're conforming, you don't know what God's will is for your life. And you're probably frustrated. You probably feel lost and you probably feel like you're just floating through life. But if you'll transform and if you'll confront your thoughts and line them up with God, it'll start to transform you through renewing your mind where you can look out and start to discover that's God's will right there. Then I'm gonna stay at it. I'm gonna go after it. It's a helmet. It's a helmet that I put on that becomes my identity and my protection. I take every thought captive and I make it obedient to Christ and it begins to renew my mind so that when I look into life, I can see his will. Some people don't even know if God's good. Some people don't even know if they can trust God. People, some people think if I give God my life, he's gonna send me over to Africa or something, something I don't wanna do. And no, God's always going to do with you what's in you. He made you. And so he's gonna line you up with how he made you. He's good. Notice his will is good pleasing and perfect his will is good his will is pleasing his will is perfect for you do you know the best place you can be in life is in the center of God's will even if it doesn't make any sense even if it doesn't look the way you thought it was going to look the center of God's will is the best place you can be but you know how you get there confront every thought what is going through my mind? That's where it starts. If we want to be a people that raise our hand and say, yes, we're saved. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're saved. It's going to be proven by the way we put on a helmet and confront our thoughts and take every thought captive. Let me say it like this. Salvation is taking every thought captive and making it obedient to God. That is a huge challenge, but that is also the awesomeness of this salvation. That I can begin to renew my mind to think like him and experience what he wants to do with me in life. Here's what the Bible says, as a man thinks, so is he. Your destination, who you are, is a subject of your thoughts. What you think about, that's who you'll become. And so we're called to test those. If there's areas in your life that you feel like, I don't know why I keep doing this, check the thoughts. Check the thoughts. 
because that's where it starts and make them obedient to God. Would God talk to you like that? Would God talk to you like that? Those are the things we confront and change. And so here's my question for you today. Who are you? If you're a subject of your thoughts, who are you? And who you are, is that who you want to be? Is that who you want to be? Because it starts with taking them captive and putting them in the right spot. And ask God to help you with that because he will. He will. If you've said yes to Jesus and felt like nothing's changed, my challenge to you is start taking these thoughts and looking at them and make them obedient to Christ. Let the renewing of your mind begin to happen and you'll test and approve God's will and you'll start to be able to look at your life and go, that's where God wants me to go right there. This is what God wants me to do right here. And you start to realize how valuable your life is on this planet. You can live through life and think you're just floating around, but when, as you start to renew your mind, you start to realize you are needed by Him. You're needed by God. You're needed. He needs you to move in the earth. And that's where you start to see His will is that he needs you. He needs you to speak to that person. He needs you to show up. He needs you to be that shoulder right now. He needs you to drive all the way across town for no reason and just show up. I mean, it's, it, who's experienced that before? Like the things that God does with you, that's like, yes, Lord, because my mind is, my mind is renewed. I'm, I'm linked in to things that he's saying. And the, the things that he does with you that are just like, whoa, that seemed really, really dumb until now. That, that, was awesome. And you start to realize God needs vessels in the earth that will say, I'm unhindered, Lord, here I am. Send me wherever you want me to go. Say whatever you, I'll say whatever you want me to say. I'm open. Here it is. There's not a bunch of romance novels in the way. There's not a bunch of stupid apps that I've downloaded that are hindering you from getting what you want. Lord, you've purchased me for you and by you. You have purchased me. May I have only on me what you want. Come on, think about that. What your phones look like. You know exactly where all those little apps are. Some of you, you should move your Facebook app and put your Bible app there and you'd be shocked how many times you open your Bible on accident. Isn't that a cool little thought? Try it. You're like, I've been reading the word like amazing, right? <laughs> because we know it. We know where they all are. We know what we wanted. We know where we want them at. It's the same with us. God purchased us for him. And I want him to be able to open you up at any time and know exactly where you are and exactly what he wants on you. Go, go, go. And you find yourself in the will of God going, man, life makes sense. I see it. That was God's will. I feel this prompting. I don't know why. It's just stirring him. I'm going I'm to follow it. It's God's will. And you see him using you in the earth, and that's when life gets fun. That's when stuff starts to make sense. That's when things get exciting because you see what God really wants to do with his people.